that bright rising star there, that's not a star, that's Mars. And, but for a short while, it's going to look awesome. In fact, in a month or so, it's going to be a super Mars. It's going to be its biggest and brightest that it's going to be for a long time. The best part of 15 years. So if you're going to take a look at it, now is a good time. Hell, you may have noticed that we recently launched another rover towards Mars. The, the Perseverance uh, the rover headed to Mars and liftoff. As the countdown to Mars continues, the perseverance of humanity launching the next generation of robotic explorers to the red planet. That's not coincidental timing. Mars at the moment is coming almost straight towards us, or maybe more to the point, we're heading straight towards it. Well, uh, kind of. You see, the Earth's orbital velocity around the Sun is about 30 kilometers per second, where Mars is a mere paltry 24 kilometers per second. That means we are currently heading towards Mars at about 6 kilometers per second. Speed of sound for reference is about 0.3 kilometers per second. 6 kilometers per second is more like railgun speed. The phrase faster than a speeding bullet just took on a whole new meaning. A magnetic railgun, and oh by the way, can shoot a projectile like this well over 100 miles at Mach 7. Seven times the speed of sound. Seven times the speed of sound. And this is why asteroid impacts are so nasty, because they always come in at railgun type velocities. A slug that big going Mach 7 puts a hole through six half inch steel plates this big. In fact, it's kind of cute listening to the man so proud of his six times the speed of sound. Just this little slug. Went through all of these. All six of those. There's not a thing in the sky that's going to survive against that. When you realize that the minimum impact velocity of asteroids is about 30 times the speed of sound. And this is why an impact merely the size of Washington, D.C. would be a planet killer for us surface dwellers. But even though we're heading towards Mars at, at about six kilometers per second, we're not going to hit it. Gravity will do its thing a long time before then. So what I've got here is the four inner planets. That's Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. And I've sped time up a lot. You see, we're the third rock from the sun. Mars is the fourth and the closer you are to the sun the shorter your years are so for us a year is a year long that's the time it takes us to go all the way around the sun for mars it takes about one and a half earth years to orbit the sun the practical upshot of which is about every two years or so we catch up with mars and get really close to it and this is why probes to mars tend to be launched about every two years or so it also means that we're really close to Mars, which means it's a fantastic time to look at it through a telescope. In fact, it's probably the best time for planetary observing that you will get for years. As of August about 2020, the Earth is here and Mars is here, and Jupiter and Saturn, you can see, are almost aligned. Now, this is actually really quite rare. Jupiter goes around the Sun about every 10 or so years, Saturn every 30 or so years. So they only line up like this about every 15 or so years. So if I now zoom in to the Earth and maybe back off a little, and I'll speed up time a little such that you can see the Earth rotating. There you go. So you see the Earth rotating now. And this is when the sun goes down. This is sunset, and this is sunrise over here. So if I now zoom out a bit, and we'll go see where Jupiter and Saturn are, they're just over there. So at sun, sunset, they're basically due southish. And this is actually really quite rare. Hey okay, guys, this is just because it's awesome. That's Jupiter up there. The guy next to him is Saturn. And that's what the bad boy looks like on the computer. It wasn't flickering quite so much. Anyway, it looks awesome. <laughs> I just wanted to share it. And once you get to about midnight, that's when Mars rises. Mars is just over there. And then if you come even further around, you'll see before dawn comes up, Venus rises and it is stunningly bright. That's Mars through the um, 150 millimeter six inch refractor. 
And there is the other big boy, the 11 inch Schmidt, also tracking Mars. Fuck. That's Mars through the other big boy. And we have a stunning dawn coming up with a stunning jewel of Venus right there in the morning, mate. Now, the planets are going to be like this for a month or two, you know, because the Earth moves around the sun fairly slowly and all that sort of thing. But after this, it's going to be at least another 10 years before they align like this again. Jupiter and Saturn, like I mentioned, only really get this close to each other about every 15 or so years. And Mars, likewise, whilst it gets good every two years, won't get as good as it is now for another 15 or so years. You see, Mars is a pretty small planet. It's about half the size of the Earth. So we only get a really good view of it when we're close to it, which is about now. And when it's on the other side of the sun, it's obviously, it's much further away and so appears much smaller, about 10 times smaller. So you have no real chance of seeing anything interesting on it whatsoever. Yep, that on the right there. That's Mars at its best and at its worst. So if Mars is getting good at the moment, and it's like this every two or so years, how could it be that Mars is currently at the best it's going to be for about 15 years? Well, Mars, it turns out, has a rather funny shaped orbit, which means that when we come up to the next point, when we're at the closest to Mars again, when it's at opposition, which will be in 2023, we won't be as close as we are now. And when we come up to this again, in uh, two years after that, which will be in 2025, it's even worse still. Now, how bright Mars appears in the sky basically depends on the size of the disk. So by 2027, it's gonna be about half the angular size, which means it'll be about one quarter of the brightness that it is at the moment, which is almost as bad as it's going to get. But it took about seven years to get that bad, and it's gonna take about the same amount of time again to get better. And in 2029, it's almost as bad again. But then our orbits start closing again. In 2031, though, it's going to be getting back for what it is now. Yeah, um, the way the world's going at the moment, it's going to be interesting to see what the world's like in 2031. And then in 2033, it's going to be about as good as it is now. So if you don't want to wait 15 years, and, you know, I've got to be real, there is a non-insignificant chance that I won't be here when that next happens, then the time is now. And likewise, if you want eyeballs on the target, well, you can see it as an incredibly red star for the next couple of months. But if you want to see it in detail, you've got about a month to find a friend with a telescope or an astronomy club or to get yourself a telescope and take a look at it or I'll show you what I can here on the Thunderfoot channel. And damn straight, if I get a better chance to hardcore time-lapse this, I'm doing it. Hell, I've already had one go at doing it, and this is what it looked like. And yes, that is actually the South Pole of Mars that you're currently looking at. And this is what about six hours of rotation looks like on Mars. So I recorded this between about midnight and six o'clock in the morning <laughs> you know that's when it was getting light we have a stunning dawn coming up with a stunning jewel of venus and yes i did something similar to this about 10 years ago when i recorded a full rotation of jupiter over a single night now that was <laughs> relatively easy because jupiter rotates about once every eight hours easily enough to record in a single night but with Mars, you can't do that because Mars rotates much more slowly, about once every 25 hours. Bummer. But a man can dream. So the way that I made this is I record about 30 seconds of video every 20 or so minutes. And then you take that 30 seconds of video and you stack a load of the frames to average out some of the atmospheric shimmer, which I do using something called Registatch, which is free software and it's absolutely amazing. And then you do some wavelet sharpening at the end and you get something like this. Now, if you want to get a good view of Mars, oddly enough, the thing that you'll find the hardest to find isn't a good telescope. <laughs> there are plenty of those on the market, but a good stable sky. You see, telescopes allow you to see two things. 
big faint objects like nebula and galaxies, that sort of thing, and bright but small objects like planets. Both of these require very different critical properties from the skies that you're under. I'm currently in a big city with lots of light pollution, so my chances of seeing low surface brightness objects like galaxies and nebula against a very bright orange glowy sky are pretty much zero. However, for planets, light pollution really doesn't matter that much because planets are just so bright. What does, however, matter is how stable the atmosphere is. I mean, just to give you a, an idea of how critical the stability of the atmosphere is, this is Saturn from the same location, from the same telescope on two consecutive nights. And just to give you an idea, the seeing can transition from one of these to the other in just a few hours. Likewise, if you want to look at these big, faint objects, stability really isn't that important, but a dark, transparent sky is, like the high western deserts in America. But oddly enough, some of these can be terrible places for planetary observing, like the plains of Wyoming, which, although they have very transparent skies, are constantly windy. Now, an easy way to find good skies is that observatories are typically built in the best places for astronomy. And one that I'm going to mention at the moment, because it's kind of interesting, is the Percival Lowell Observatory, just above Flagstaff. And I actually mention that because one of the things it was built for was to look at Mars and to catch one of the last decent oppositions of Mars a hundred or so years ago. Sadly, Percy used the telescope to uh, discover canals on Mars. Yeah, uh, that, that didn't aid so well. Now, you can actually visit the observatory and look through that telescope, and it's well worth a visit if you happen to be in Flagstaff. Speak from personal experience, I've looked through that telescope. It's awesome. But what if you can't make it to an observatory site for clear skies? How can you find where the good skies are? Well, if you're in the US, I strongly recommend cleardarkskies.com. When I'm in America, I use that all the time because it's just bloody awesome for transparency and seeing conditions. For the rest of the world, Skippy Sky is pretty decent. Now, the way it typically goes is in the early evening, the atmosphere is more turbulent and then it, as it cools down, it stabilizes. So the planetary viewing typically goes from poor in the early evening, then it gets better and better as the night goes on. But this is far from the rule. All sorts of things can happen to the turbulence of the atmosphere over the course of an evening. To get an entire night of good planetary observing is rare. Now, luckily for me, occasionally here, we get really hot still days, which are horrible, followed by really hot still nights, which are horrible. However, they do give a fantastically still atmosphere, which allowed me to get all of this footage of Mars. As for which telescope is best? Well, I had two big boys out here, the 11-inch Schmidt and a 6-inch refractor. Honestly, the 11-inch Schmidt wins out here, but both of these are expensive telescopes, clocking in at about mm, $3,000-ish. Both are beautiful machines, but neither are really sensible starter telescopes. Incidentally, this is another reason to steer clear of the EV scope, because all Mars will ever look like through the EV scope is a bright spot. I couldn't actually find anyone who had posted a picture of Mars with the EV scope, but I did find a picture of Saturn with the uh, 100 times better than a regular telescope EV scope. Now, that cost about $3,000, by the way. That's about the same price as the Sky Cannon. And this, for comparison, is what Saturn looks like through the Sky Cannon and Mars at the same magnification. Just to give you an idea of what you might expect to see of Mars through the EV scope. Anyway, like I was saying, under most conditions, it's likely that it won't be the telescope that limits what you can see, but your atmosphere. The best all-round scope is probably the 8-inch Schmidt, you know, in terms of portability. It's versatile enough to give you good views of the planet. It's got enough light gathering to give you good views of the nebula. Plus, a driven mount gives you a decent entry window to astrophotography. However, on the next good night I get, I'm going to get the telescopes out and do a side-by-side -side comparison of what Mars looks like through all of these telescopes. So yeah, Mars is good now. And if you want to see a polar ice cap on another planet, 
The time is now. And if you've got a friend who's into this sort of thing, it might be good to share this video with them because if they miss it now, it's going to be a while. However, if you really want advice on buying a telescope in the meantime, the advice in this video is pretty much as valid as it's ever been. And there are links to many of these telescopes in my Amazon store below. Uh, many thanks to those who support this channel through Patreon. And if you don't want to miss out on more great videos like this, make sure you hit the notification bell. And uh, thanks for watching.